All right. Let me just adjust the seat. There we go. All right. Hello, everybody. We are finally live. Let me know if you can hear me, if the microphone is going fine. It should be fine. I, I like, triple-checked everything before I started the live stream. Also, unusually, I was able to set everything up much faster than normal, so I was kind of like, what did I do differently that I had all this extra time to just sit around? So, kind of weird. Usually it takes me a solid hour to set up for tea time. Okay. So, we have Chase's, ri Chase's Railway Lines. Young Ship Maritime Historian. Hello. Hello, Tyler. Hello, Steve. Um, let's see. Hello, Brayden. Hello, Daniel. Isaiah. Kevin. Alex and the Seas of Bulgaria. And Dino DeSantis. Hello from Nashville, says Dino. Wow, pretty cool. Um, so today I wanted to talk a bit about the SS United States and kind of what my thoughts are on the situation, why I created a post about it, and that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll get into all that. Um, it is really cold here. I don't know if Ozzy's going to show up, but he's probably going to ask, you know, what what uh, the temperature or the weather is like here. And it is snowing. <laughs> For most of the day, it was snowing all over the state of Oregon. And um, pretty much everywhere except where I am. And I was kind of getting upset about it. I was like, everybody's getting snow. Even my friend in Idaho is getting snow. And I'm not getting any snow. It seems like it was just snowing everywhere but where I was. And, uh, and so, yeah. Um, but about an hour ago or so, it started snowing. So now I'm happy. <laughs> so, right now there's a... A light sprinkling of snow coming down. It is getting later in the day, so it's going to get colder, so the snow might stick to the ground overnight. Um, all right. Dino says, not getting sound. Well, I don't know. Everyone else says they hear me, so that's weird. Um, so let me try to answer some questions here. Young Ship Maritime Historian asks... Sorry, I'm just going to turn on the, the water so I can get started on tea. Asks, um, Alex, I have a question. I saw your post about the SS United States. It is not being scrapped, right? If it is not going to be scrapped, I would be happy. If it is going to be scrapped, I would be sad. So, no, the, the issue at the moment is not about scrapping. But depending on how this issue plays out will depend on if the ship will be more likely to be scrapped in the future. So this is not an issue of whether the ship is going to be scrapped or not. It's an issue of what's going to happen to the ship in the near future. So, um, yeah, and we'll kind of talk about that as we go along. Um, Tyler says, after reading your post, I have to ask, what is the point of owning a ship if you don't do anything with it? RXR Realty has owned her for three years, and they did nothing. So, with a lot of cases, you have people or whole organizations who are really passionate about something or are really greedy about something. Now, I don't know who RXR Realty is. I can't say either one. Let's just assume they're passionate about the ship. Um... But sometimes that, that passion can kind of lead to making decisions that, you know, they don't really know how it will play out. I can only assume that RXR Realty assumed ownership of the ship, but didn't actually have the means to develop it. I think they were hoping that they had the means to develop it. And if that's the case, maybe after three years, they just, none of their plans to develop it have really gone through. I don't know. But a lot of the times that happened even to the Queen Mary. There were companies that claimed that they wanted to lease the ship from Long Beach because they really wanted to redevelop the Queen Mary and, and make her even more successful. And, you know, but the thing is, is that 
they go in there with all these big hopes, but no plan of action, no way to make that action happen. And so, you know, what you need for a project like that is investors. You need people who have a lot of money who are willing to invest in your dreams. Um, and so sometimes the idea that, oh, we're going to get tons of investors will kind of take over the idea that actually we don't have much of a product to offer. So the problem with the SS United States is that, um, sorry, just reading some comments. Um, the problem with the SS United States is that the ocean liner fans, they can see a value in the ship that sits there in Philadelphia right now. They see a value in it. The problem is everyone else who's not an ocean liner fan sees no value in it because when they look at it, there's nothing original left on the inside. Yeah, you have the exterior, but where's the insides? Where's the beauty? You know, um, they ripped out all of the interiors of the ship to supposedly get rid of all the um, asbestos that was inside. You know, the asbestos was there to help insulate and prevent fires from spreading, all that kind of stuff. Now, a Queen Mary is almost made of, in of asbestos. Yet, they've never gone through and just completely stripped the entire ship just because of the asbestos. In fact, the thing about asbestos is, if you don't touch it, you'll be fine. If you don't bother it, and it, you know, it won't bother you. So, the thing was, was I, I don't know what led them to want to gut the entire ship of asbestos. But it was a very bad decision, in my opinion. When they did that, they removed any of the value that ship had. And, yeah, some of the artifacts were saved and are in various museums or collections, but not all of it. A great deal of the ship is not on the ship. And it's because of that that there is nothing to show people. Investors who might be interested, when they suddenly realize there's nothing left inside the ship, it's just a skeleton of what it once was, then they're like, well, then what's the point? You know, there's nothing historical left inside the ship. The ship itself is historic, but, you know, it's, it, there's not much, you know. So that's the problem is there's all these really hopeful people who say, oh, but we can develop the ship and we can turn it into a hotel or a museum. Well, the problem is, is now you have to take all your expensive ideas and do something even more expensive with it, which is to find a way to, like, fit everything like a puzzle piece inside of an old shell that you can't, you know, alter too much. So, you know, you're asking people to, to take something that's already a huge investment and develop it into an antiquated structure. And right there, your profit margins shrink. So when you look at how much money you'll get back from the idea, it's not much. It's not much. You know, the other thing, too, is that the Queen Mary, you have to remember, you guys, in the United States, having an ocean liner converted to a hotel or museum and having it remain is a really rare thing. <laughs> the Queen Mary, it, it wasn't just a system of steps to get the Queen Mary to to still be preserved as much as she is. There is a certain amount of luck involved. The Queen Mary is sitting next to land that is considered part of the package, you know? She doesn't have to pay docking fees because that land that she's, you know, that she's moored to is like hers. It's it's her land, you know? Um so that's already an expense that the Queen Mary doesn't have to worry about. Um, and the fact that a lot of the interiors are still there. Yeah, they removed a, a, a huge amount of interiors of the ship, but all the major stuff people want to see is on the Queen Mary. It's still there. Um, you know, and then the fact that almost immediately after, you know, after completing the conversion, the ship was open to the public as a hotel and museum and convention center. So almost immediately, she could start making the money back. 
But as far as I can tell with the SS United States, after gutting it, it never opened as anything. So, you know, all that money went to waste. So, you know, it's just... And the other thing, too, about the Queen Mary being so lucky is just that, you know, by happenstance over the years, she's been able to turn enough of a profit to not close down permanently. I mean, granted, she kind of did with the COVID thing, but she's about to open back up again. That is also very lucky. There's a lot of business. My business. I had a cafe before the pandemic. That permanently closed. Sayonara. No more. Couldn't survive the pandemic. The fact that the Queen Mary has once again survived another <laughs> major global, you know, transition is just mind-boggling. So the SS United States, you know, you can make all these plans, but there is a certain amount of luck involved. So, you know, and some people have asked, well, how come the SS United States doesn't get the same love that Queen Mary gets? Well, it could be that people have been visiting the Queen Mary for 50 some odd years in Long Beach, and they've developed, uh, you know, an emotional attachment to it. They've They've got memories on it. But, you know, unless you've gone to one of those private tours on the SS United States, most people have never been on it, you know, since it, it retired from service. So you have whole generations of people who've never grown an attachment to it. And, um, you know, and that's part of the reason it's been almost forgotten. So, you know, there is a certain amount of luck that's involved. All right, let that pre-warm. Um, let's see. Now, as to what my opinion on the subject is... <sighs> Look, I know I've said that I'm not a fan of the SS United States. And that's true. I'm not a fan of the SS United States. I don't think it's beautiful. I never thought that the interiors look beautiful. I'm not really much into ships that are built, you know, post-World War II, you know. But that doesn't mean that I, I have some kind of animosity towards it. I really don't. I would love to see the SS United States restored and reopened as a museum or hotel, so that way people can enjoy another old ocean liner. You know, perhaps if the SS United States were, were operated as a successful attraction, that would help draw tourists to my beloved attraction, the Queen Mary. So I do not want the SS United States to be scrapped or anything like that. But that being said, I have very low hopes for the SS United States because of all the aforementioned stuff. I mean, the fact that there's almost nothing of value left on the ship aside from her engines. But, you know, that's it, you know. There are people who don't care about engines. There are people who care about historic interiors, and the ship has none left. You know, so... Um, and the thing is, the situation the SS United States is facing right now is that they were, they're having a dispute, and this is as far as I understand it, but they're having a dispute over the docking fees. Uh, the docking fees, I think were something like close to $90,000 a month or something like that. And now they've been raised to 105,000. Um, and that just happens to be too much for the, um, SS United States Conservancy to afford. Um, so the situation they're facing right now is, first, they're expected to pay all the money they owe back, you know, because they've been sitting there for a while after the, the, the rent increase of the dock went up. Um, then, if they're going to stay there, they're going to need some help with being able to afford the docking fee every month, you know, um, because just an infusion of cash to help them pay it back is not enough. They, they still don't earn the income required to pay for the docking fee. So they need help with that. And if 
you know, if staying there is not an option, well, they still need help paying back what they owe, plus they need a new home for the SS United States and possibly a tugboat to take it there, unless they have connections. Um, and when all this information kind of went out, I was contacted by somebody who watches my channel, and they were really, really passionate about trying to, to help the SS United States through this tough time, and they immediately reached out to me and was like, hey, you can contact the Conservancy and help them, and I'm like, I can't help them. They're, I mean, you know, first of all, I'm 3,000 miles away. I don't have a means to travel there to do anything specific. You know, I'm like, there's not much I can do. I could call them and ask them questions about what's going on, but it, no matter what they tell me, there's nothing I can do to help them, you know? So uh, I tried to tell this person that, but they insisted that I could call them and ask questions, and I'm like, I... What will that do? I could ask them all the questions I want till I'm blue in the face, but I can't help them, you know? Um, and so what I did was I created a, a community post basically telling my viewers, you know, if you have the means to make a significant contribution, heck, let me just say it you know, out loud. If you're rich, like filthy rich, and you want to help the SS United States, and it's that is something you want to do in life, then by all means, now is the time to act. Um, but someone asked me later, they're like, you know, do you think that small contributions will help? And I said, unless, you know, unless there is a lot of small contributions flooding in, then no, small contributions are not going to help in this case um, because they're on a time, time crunch, you know. So, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what's going on. You know, and I, I, I think the outlook is pretty bleak. You know, the I've been following very loosely what's been happening with the SS United States. You know, since the year 2020, and I, I, I came to realize I'm like, I don't think anything's going to happen for this ship. You know, it would need a major intervention, and there's no movement behind that. You know, so. Yeah, it's it's pretty bleak, but, you know, I did what I could. Um, let's see here. Um, hello, LMR Trains. Young Ship Maritime Historian. Yeah, we were talking about that in the last live stream about, you know, what had happened if the QE was put next to the Queen Mary in Long Beach. And the short answer is both ships would have failed miserably. The Queen Mary already has difficulty bringing in large numbers of visitors to make her overwhelmingly popular and overwhelming, overwhelmingly successful. So if you then cut what the Queen Mary gets in half and give it to the Queen Elizabeth, which is right next door then it, both ships will fail. Both of them will fail, undoubtedly, no question, you know, and end of the line for them. So no, it would not have been a good idea if QE was still around to keep her next to the Queen Mary in Long Beach. Would have been a horrible idea, horrible idea. So, um, let's see. Um, Alex in the seaside of Bulgaria says, which is the most famous ocean liner of all time? That would technically be the Titanic. Now, when the Queen Mary retired in 1967, the Queen Mary was the most famous ocean liner of all time. But after James Cameron's Titanic movie, that, that sealed the deal. Titanic is now the most famous ocean liner of all time. So, um... Stephanie Kennington says, dumb question, if the Titanic hadn't carried mail, what would it be instead of RMS? Then it would be SS for steamship. Um, let's see. Stephen Hemingway says, 
SSUS, would it not be kinder to clean it and sink it as a reef? It depends on who you ask. <laughs> Some people are like, stop polluting the environment. But, um, I mean, yeah, you know, clean ships can make for good reefs. If the reefs are even growing. Because, you know, there's another issue there, too, which is, like, the ocean water temperatures are changing. So reefs are having a hard time growing in the first place. So you could just keep dumping ships down in the sea. That doesn't make it so the reefs will keep growing, you know. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Doc says, made a matcha latte, finally sat down. Awesome. I gotta um, prepare this uh, this tea. Um, Oceaner Productions says, 1969 to 1978, the SS United States was sold from the U.S. Navy. 1978 to 1996 went under many ownership changes and location changes. And then 1996 to now is in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, Carrie says, I'm thinking it will come down to dollars. The cost has to way exceed the return. Also, the cruise liner enthusiasts are fewer and fewer as time goes on. I don't think ocean liner enthusiasts get fewer and fewer. I think it's growing, if anything, because of the whole Titanic thing. I mean, when you think about it, 1996, there would have been very few ocean liner enthusiasts, and most of them would have been quite old. Um, but after James Cameron's movie, it just blew up, just completely blew up. And right now, on my channel, I mean, I, I would say that most of the people who are probably watching this live stream or will watch it in the coming, you know, days, most of them are probably younger than me and i'm 30 you know so yeah i yeah i don't uh, i don't think that's an issue i think the issue really is just that uh the population in general just isn't as interested in ocean liners or steam history as we would hope okay i'm gonna dump out half of this and all of this Oh, wow, that's really hot. Okay. Now we'll put this in there. So five minutes on that. It's 423. So 428. I have to remember 428. I don't feel like setting up a timer. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I suppose I'll just... Yeah, we'll do that. It's really cold both outside and in my house right now, so having a nice... Spot of tea will feel amazing. All right, so um, Carrie says I could see a developer constructing a replica building in Vegas. That hotel would be cost effective. Yeah, maybe. Um. Young Ship Maritime Historian says, RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth are my all-time favorite ships. Alex, I like your videos. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Yeah, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth are, are my favorite. Queen Mary is my favorite, then Mauritania, then Queen Elizabeth. But yeah. Uh, Brayden says, what are your favorite rooms on the Queen Mary? Um, so I have two favorite rooms on the Queen Mary. One of them no longer exists, and that would be the um, the second-class overflow lounge on A deck. That no longer exists. It was turned into, um, into a, a, a beachcombers club. Now it's considered the capstan lounge, and it's only used really for, for booked parties and stuff like that um and the capstan lounge doesn't look 
the way it did in the 1930s. It's it's very very because all of it was gutted and changed and all that. So um, the other one I really like is the first class main lounge. I think that's a really beautiful room, especially if it looked as it did in the 1930s. Um, Young ship maritime historian says Alex when you when Kennard owned the Armas Olympic. Why did they not paint the funnels red and black? I'm not fully sure. Probably it's just out of respect for the heritage of the ship. I mean, for most of its life, it was a White Star Line ship. So it's po it's possibly to ensure that the White Star ships were still recognizable among the Cunard ships. So that could be why. But I, I don't actually know the real answer. Let's see. Everyone's saying hi, Moonzer, but I don't see Moonzer in the chat. That's strange. Doc says, Alex, you know I'm going to ask, is there an archives set up for the SS United States, the ship you posted about? Any place that logged all the treasures that were inside? No, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, there's, there's, the artifacts are in various collections and some museums, but there is no archive of them. Um, Alex in the seaside of Bulgaria says, do, do you know which is the first, two more minutes on the T, do you know which is the first ocean liner of the Cunard line and the White Star line? So technically, the very first ocean liner of the Cunard Line was the um, was the RMS Britannia, but before the Britannia and before Cunard Line existed, um, Samuel Cunard owned another ocean liner before it, and I don't remember the name unfortunately. But it, yeah, there was an ocean liner before it, but technically, the first ocean liner owned by by the Cunard line was the RMS Britannia. Um, the first ocean liner of White Star Line, I don't remember. I don't remember. Oh boy. Tyler, <laughs> that's not. Uh, I don't want to hear that I'd make a good Santa. Brayden Edwards says, You have. Any room ideas I should build in my Lego Queen Mary? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Mike says Moonzer is young ship maritime star. Okay. Um, Moonzer says, Alex, my favorite rooms on the Queen Mary are the swimming pool and the Windsor State Room. Interesting. Yeah, I like the swimming pool a lot. I've seen it once. Uh, I was on a haunted tour, and we walked in there, and they did all these lights and special effects and stuff. It was pretty hokey, but, you know, it was interesting to see the room itself. All right. Stephanie says, I feel like I never hear about the Mauritania. Um, like ever? Like anywhere? I mean, it is, it is more obscure than Titanic, so I mean, and more obscure than Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth and, you know, SS United States. So it's, you know, because it's more obscure than those ships, it's probably less likely to be something that you hear on a, on a, you know, average daily basis. Uh, let me just pour this tea, and I, I got something to tell you guys. Ooh, this is a really hot teapot. Okay. So. All 
right. The tea is made. Okay, so... Ken says, biggest problem with SSUS is lack of public interest. Definitely. Um... Ah, yeah, Kevin says, the ship before Armis Britannia was SS Royal William. Yep, that's right. Thank you for that, because I was I had totally forgotten what it was. Um, let's see. Um, so, I was going to tell you. Oh, so... I am working on a video about RMS Queen Elizabeth currently. I was hoping to have it out on Friday, but after you know, after writing and writing and writing the script, I realized that it's going to take longer than Friday. So it's probably going to have to be next Friday. But this Friday, I think I have enough information to create a um, a construction update video on the Queen Mary. So. Um, I don't have images or video to show you guys of that work, but um, I do have information to share with people. So, yeah, you can look forward to that on Friday, and the next Friday will be a history video about the RMS Queen Elizabeth. Um, okay, so let's see. What was Tyler saying? Alex, when I was on Haunted Tour on the Queen Mary, the tour said that the woman who was supposed to be the lady in white stabbed her husband for cheating. And I said, maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. Wow, geez. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. It's... Is it still snowing outside? I don't think it's snowing anymore. It was snowing a minute ago. I was hoping if it kept going, it would stick to the ground and we'd have a nice, you know, nice uh, blanket of snow everywhere. Kevin says the first white starline ship is SS Oceanic. Interesting. Daniel says, Alex, have you heard of Heiss? He works at a narrow gauge railroad uh, in Colorado. The Colorado Railroad Museum. He does live streams. Yes, I have heard of Heiss. Dangerous Brian says, just Googled it. The first white starline ship was, in fact, called Oceanic. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, there is a lot going on in terms of ocean liner news <laughs> at the moment. It's, you know, everything's up in the air as to what will happen with the SS United States and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I wish it good luck, you know, that it'll survive. Because if, if it were to be turned into a successful attraction, you know, it, it that could generate interest towards the Queen Mary, which is something I'm interested in. So... Um, Stephen says, Armis Queen Elizabeth, there are a lot of unknowns about her. For example, what her interior should have looked like, rather as per the post-war maiden voyage. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand it, only some things were altered for the post-war, but... They already had the designs in mind uh, pre-war, for the most part. Braden Edwards says, What is your favorite thing about the RMS Queen Mary? I think my favorite thing is her war service. Because her war service, a lot of people misunderstand it, I think. That... She wasn't just a troop ship. And it's unfortunate that all that's ever talked about of the Queen Mary's war service is that she transported troops. No one really talks about how she directly affected, you know, the fact that, um, what am I trying to say? 
that without her, the first battle at El Alamein would not have been won. You know, there probably wouldn't have even been a second battle. Um, you know, um, and then the other thing, too, is that the Queen Mary was, you know, used as kind of the head ship of Operation Bolero. That's something no one's ever really talked about. I think I'm the only person on YouTube to have mentioned that ever. Um, you know, and then just all the people who were transported aboard her in those years and just all that she had undergone, you know, in those years of war service. It was incredible. I'm currently double checking my research on Queen Elizabeth during the war years because I'm it's part of the, the script I'm, I'm writing for my uh, short video about the Queen Elizabeth. But the Queen Elizabeth did not have that many things of, n you know, n not that many things to, what am I trying to say? Notable things, things like that. Like she, what, she didn't win a battle like the Queen Mary did. She didn't, you know, she wasn't the headship of Operation Bolero, you know, the Queen Mary was. So there's, you know, so the Queen Elizabeth, if anything, is one of those ships where it could be understandable why she would be more obscure. You know, but, uh, but yeah, so. Uh, Stephanie says, was it the Atlantic that was pierced by a fishing boat? Mm, I don't know. I wonder if somebody else in the chat might know. Um, Alex on the seaside of Bulgaria. I don't know enough about ocean liners to be able to tell you which of the ships I've heard of belongs to which line. So yeah, I've heard of the MS Stockholm, but I couldn't have told you that was from the Swedish America line. Like, you know, I, I've, I've heard of it, but just don't know where it belongs to. So, I, unfortunately, I'm not that well-versed in ocean liners in general. I'm still at, at the early stages of learning about ocean liners. Daniel says, what are your thoughts on him? Um, I don't know. I, I think it would be inappropriate for me to share, you know, personal, you know, uh, opinions about YouTubers. Uh, let's see. SS United States has been in limbo for a long time. Yeah, that's that's true. Let's see. The first one. Alex in the seaside of Bulgaria says, "Well, actually, the first White Star Line ship was the Elizabeth." I'm talking about the time before Thomas Ismay came and bought the company. Hmm. Brayden says that you're going to build the my favorite room on the Queen Mary and Lego. You'd have to have a really large Queen Mary, because that's a very small room. Uh, hello, Rayanne. How's it going? Top Impressive Line says, Hello, Alex. Here's a video suggestion. How ocean liners were converted from coal burning to oil burning. Someone's actually already done a video on that. So I feel, I, you know, I feel like I'd just be you know, rehashing uh, an already covered topic. So what just happened? I clicked on something and then Evan Scott says, are you ready for the Titanic demo update? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited about it. I get to try it before a lot of other people get to try it. So, <laughs> so there will be, 
videos ready for... So basically, like, two hours before the public gets to play the game, I will be able to release a video about the game. So I'm actually really excited about that. Um... Uh, Transit Biker... No, I don't have that book. Let's see... Carter says, Did, Do you go to Birth of a Legend? I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, the music is, uh... Is old 30s and 40s band music. Um... What is going on? Yeah, that person's not gonna. Um, Kevin says, SS Oceanic was the first ship built for White Star Line, but they have ships from the 1840s. Ah, that confuses me. Um, Doc says, have there been any well-known people married on the Queen Mary or other well-known ocean liner weddings? As far as my understanding, nobody's been married on ocean liners. It was not I don't know the exact reasons, but there was something about the British Merchant Navy not being able to do that, you know? Um, the Merchant Navy was seen as as really serious, so people getting married on an ocean liner it just wasn't a thing. Um, but in the time since the Queen Mary has been retired, people have gotten married on the Queen, on the Queen Mary. But I don't know if there's been anybody who's been famous or notable who has gotten married on the ship. So I couldn't tell you that, but I know that in the days when the ship was at sea, people didn't get married on the ship. I can't even pronounce... I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name, but... Just discovered this channel. Great stuff. Keep up the good work. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for joining the channel. Young Chip Maritime... Or Moonzer says... Ha Alex, have you seen the models on the RMS Queen Mary's Promenade deck? One of the models, or the Queen Mary's Builder's model, was also made in the 1930s. Yes, definitely. I took video of it. It's in... It's in my video tour of the um, of the Queen Mary. So I did a virtual tour of the Queen Mary. It's on my channel. When you go to my main page, you'll see it right there. Um, but yeah, really cool video. You guys should check it out. Um, but yeah, in there I show the the model, the builder's model of the Queen Mary. That builder's model is no longer on the Queen Mary though. It was given back to the museum that owns it. Chris, <laughs> Alex, I believe you'd be excited to have a large 1-6 scale RMS Queen Mary. Where would I fit it? That thing would be so huge. It would be, like, large enough that I could live on it. <laughs> Transit Biker says, it's an excellent book. Highly recommend awesome um i'll see if i can get it there's a lot of books on my list Stephanie says first time i saw the turkish bath on titanic honor and glory i thought the man was in an iron lung it does look like that doesn't it looks like he's in an iron lung yeah that's the electric bath I 
I think when I first saw it, I was pretty frightened because <laughs> I didn't expect to see it there. I kind of like turned the corner and I saw it and I was like, ooh, you know. And at the time, I was roaming through the ship in the night version. So when I walked in there, it was very dark and I was just, yeah, it freaked me out a good bit. Um, top impressive line, that was, again, another video that somebody did. They did it really, really well. And, um, well, actually, no, they didn't do the Cunard line. They did the White Star line. I don't know. I did something similar. I did a video called, um, I think it was called, like, What Happened to Ocean Liners? And if you watch that, I actually do talk a bit about um, the founding of the Cunard line and then you know, the pinnacle of their of their time on the ocean, which was the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. And then I talk a little bit about the QE2 and then the Queen Mary 2. So I kind of have a video about that. But you guys, don't, don't worry about suggesting videos to me. I have not run out of ideas. Believe me, I have around two years worth of ideas. The problem isn't that I'm out of ideas. The problem is that I don't have enough time in the day to work on all the ideas. So, but yeah, don't worry, you guys. I have plenty of videos uh, in mind. Monk says, hello, Alex. Long time no see. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Transit Biker says, it's international law. You need date, time, and location. Oh, for the marriage thing? Okay, that makes sense. And Steve says, British merchant marine captains were not ordained during Queen Mary's service years. Yeah, that's that's what I heard. Yeah. And Gaming says, what are you eating, Cap? <laughs> um... It's funny, I just learned about uh, the Gen Z word cap, which is, like, basically means, like, crap. So, I don't know if you're insulting me or not. <laughs> but for those who do want to know, today I'm having uh, dark chocolate-covered McVitie's, and then I have my um, homemade Scottish shortbread, which I should be eating faster because my tea's going to get cold. LMG vids. Yeah, it does look like Bob Iger in his iron lung. Tyler says, I watched the historian edition of the real-time sinking of Titanic seven times, and it is amazingly more accurate than the original. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Thank you so much, Brayden. Hello, Chase Railway Lines. Andy Gaming says, what engines for your layout you may be getting? Um, so, well, I don't think I have any plans to get engines for the time being. They're very, 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 very expensive. I mean, some of these engines, I could buy a brand new, literally, I think one of the, yeah. <laughs> I could buy an iPhone 14 for the price that some of these engines cost. So, yeah, I I don't see myself buying an engine anytime soon. I have two engines already. I have a Forney, which is the one that's running behind me. And then I have a um, Porter engine. So I've got two of them. You know, I don't have a need for a third. But one day, if I find a good deal, like a really, really good deal... I might get a third engine. But for the time being, I'm saving up all my money for my trip to the UK. I'm hoping that by that by fall, I'll have all the money. I think, in fact, in the coming months, I'll have half of the money I need saved up for it. And then, you know, hopefully over the course of spring and summer, um, I can finish saving up for the rest of it. So I, I actually think, and I hopefully I'm not jinxing myself, but I actually think I might have... All the money I need saved up this fall to 
you know, take my voyage on the Queen Mary 2 and go to the UK. So, yeah, it's looking it's looking good. Hopefully it, it, it stays good. <laughs> um, Moonzer says, did the RMS Queen Mary really crash into a ship called the Carousel? No, it crashed into a ship called HMS Curacoa. And that was actually a pretty a pretty sad thing. I think a lot of people know it, but just to kind of recap, um, the HMS Curacoa was the escort ship that was going to escort the Queen Mary into um, the, f the Firth of the Clyde. And um, the Queen Mary was on a zigzag course uh, as per usual routine during the war because of uh, trying to... Uh, evade, you know, German ships or U-boats, and the HMS Curacoa, they had assumed that if they were to turn towards the ship, the Queen Mary would give them the right of way, because they're the escort ship. Meanwhile, on the Queen Mary, the Queen Mary thought the escort ship would give them the right of way, because they're the ship being escorted. They're the larger one that poses more of a danger. And so it's because of that mi that mix-up that uh, it was too late to steer the ships away from each other, and Queen Mary um, sliced HMS Curacoa in half, and um, and the Curacoa quickly sank. There was only one photograph taken of the entire event. I showed that in my video about that event, um, and uh, yeah, and over three hundred. Um, over 300 British men had died in that sinking. So it was pretty, pretty sad, pretty tragic. Um, where is it? Andy says, I meant chap. Okay. <laughs> I was okay. You were calling me crap. I was like, that doesn't feel very nice. Um, let's see. Shibert says, do you own any Queen Mary memorabilia? In fact, I do. Um, so this this very set of china that I'm eating off of and drinking off of um, all came from the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. So, yeah, this is authentic china from the ships that was actually used. You know, some British man's large mustache was on this very cup, so. And then behind the camera where you guys can't see, on the opposite wall... I have a shelf of Queen Mary memorabilia. I have a race card for doing the little fake horse races that they did. I have a program which tells you about the events happening on the ship. It's not much. It wasn't a cruise ship. It's an ocean liner. So, um, and then I have a, I think probably my most prized possession is a menu from second class on the Queen Mary and it was a menu from August 30th, 1939. The start, the first day of the last voyage, last peacetime voyage. It was on that very voyage where the ship was carrying thousands of refugees to the United States that Prime Minister Neville Cham Chamberlain declared over the radio waves that Great Britain was at war with Germany. So I have a menu from that very voyage, and that's probably one of my most prized possessions. I also have a plate, so if I move this and I can show you. I have this exact plate, but it's a kosher plate, and it's on my shelf behind the camera. Um, so it's this same type of plate, but it's a kosher plate. It's, it says meat on it, and it also says something written in Hebrew. Um, it probably says meat in Hebrew. Um, and so, yeah, that was the... that Actually, that plate was the very first Queen Mary um, artifact that I ever bought. And that was originally going to be the only one. And I bought it. It was only $20. Big shocker. Because it's real, you know... It's real, um, uh, uh, I forget the name. It's like, it's China. But, um, yeah, and that's my first one. And then 
after I got the plate, I got um, a souvenir ashtray. So the Queen Mary sold these souvenir ashtrays between the 1930s and the 1950s. And they have blue butterfly wings uh, behind an inverted painting of the Queen Mary. And that's at the bottom of the ashtray. And the ashtray looks beautiful. Um, so I have one of those, and mine dates back to the 1930s, and it's in remarkably good condition. Most people who have the ashtrays, those ashtrays were actually used by the people who bought them. And so therefore you could see the effects of it. You know, the glass is, is tinted, the, the butterfly wings have long ago since dried out and burnt, um, just from the intense heat of the ashes of the cigarettes and cigars. But mine was never used, and so um, it's in perfect condition it looks like it literally looks like it did the day it was sold it is that good of condition so i was really lucky to get a hold of that for a very cheap price um and that's it for my queen mary possessions yeah otherwise this makes up the bulk of it all this this whole china set everything here so pretty neat um Okay, Chase's Railway Lines says narrow gauge O-130 are expensive. The scale HO-130, all that is extremely expensive. Yeah, all the narrow gauge stuff is extremely expensive. Top Impressive Line says, Alex, how long does it take usually to make a video, i.e. researching, recording, editing? Depending on the subject matter, you know, if it's a really easy to learn subject, something very simple, I can make it in about a week. So that's everything from researching it, writing the, the script, editing the script, narrating the script, putting the script together with, you know, images that I researched and then put all that together, add music to it, publish it. I can probably do that in a week, but that's with a really simple, very easy to do um, subject. Um, in fact, an example of that is I did a video about the Benson Hotel here in Portland. That was a one week video. And because there wasn't, there wasn't much else, you know, to worry about, but there were videos that have taken me a whole year to do. So, uh, my video about the Disneyland railroad my original version of that video, which was published last year, took a whole year to do. Um, my very first Queen Mary video took a whole year to do because at the time I was still new to the Queen Mary. When I first got the idea to make a Queen Mary video, I knew that I couldn't just open my mouth and start talking about it or else all the wrong information will spill out. So I literally spent a year researching the ship and double checking everything I learned and then I started making my first videos. And the first videos were still a little bit inaccurate, but I've gotten much, much better over time to now, I barely get anything pointed out ever on my videos. Oftentimes I actually teach people who've known about the ship for a long time, new things. So that's, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah. I think the longest a video has ever taken me was a full year. Yeah, a full year. So, it's, it's pretty incredible. Some videos take three months. Uh, oh, I did a video about the Johann von Oldenbarnevelt. I never published it because I'll tell you in a bit. But um, that video took me six months. I researched that for six months. That was the reason why it took so long was because it was so difficult to find a lot of information about it. Thankfully, I did. Um, and it was really difficult to find enough images of the ship to make a video out of it. Because you can't have a video if you don't have images. So it took uh, six months to do that. I was finally putting the video together. It was ready to publish. And then Ocean Liner Designs published his video and it was really good. And I was just kind of like, well, I don't want to publish my video now because I think his was better and mine will just kind of look like, you know, uh, not as good in comparison. So I'm like, I'll just focus on something else, you know? So that was one of those things, you know, it, it, it takes anywhere from, you know, a week to a whole year to do a video. Um, all right, let's see. Ryan says, better ask Santa for more money instead of presents at Christmas, just in case you don't make the amount of money you need. 
Yeah, well... I don't know. I think it'll happen. Yeah. If anybody feels like helping me out, like some people, they want to give me money for like a cup of coffee or something. If anybody feels like donating to the channel for various reasons, just check the description of all my videos. Literally all my videos have it. In the description is a link to um, to my video and my GoFundMe page for funding my UK trip. So people can help me out with that if they wish. But otherwise I'm saving up mostly my own money for it. Air arrow. Yeah, it is. Alex on the seaside of Bulgaria says, Do you know how many four funneled ocean liners were built in total? I unfortunately don't. They should be 13. Four Kaiser class, three Kennard, three White Star, SS Deutschland, and two Union Castle line ones. I'll take your word for it, because I don't know. Carter Asher says, did you see the filming locations at Titanic Belfast? Uh, I haven't been there yet. I haven't been to the UK yet. So it, my, when I, when I book the trip later this year, you know, God willing, when I book the trip later this year, this will be my first time ever leaving my country. So that'll be, um, yeah, that'll be a, a whole new thing for me. LMG vids, yeah, but no cap, it, you say no cap because you mean no crap, you're not lying. Like, this isn't, you know, this isn't like, I'm not giving you any crap, so no cap. That's why that, I watched a video on it the other day. <laughs> I actually watch videos on, on Gen Z slang because sometimes I get, you know, people, Gen Z people are talking to me and I have no idea what they're saying. It's like they're speaking a whole different language. So I'm kind of like, what are you, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I like study Gen Z language sometimes. Um, Shibbert says, will you be planning a meetup on the Queen Mary once she reopens? No, unfortunately I will not. I have received a lot of death threats over the years, so I've learned to keep my distance from the public. So unfortunately I will not be doing that. Um, you know, and you can say thank you to the people who have no control over themselves and threaten my life, so. Um, LMG Vid says, Gen Z is like a whole different language. It really is. It's like a whole different language of its own. Hello, Cryo Man. Doc says, was smoking as common in the UK as it was in the States? Were people really smoking on the Queen Mary or other liners? Absolutely. Smoking was just as common in the UK I don't think, no, yeah, it was just as common, you know? So, yeah, that's the whole reason why they, they built smoking rooms on ocean liners like that, because there were so many people who smoked, which is actually kind of funny that they have a smoking room, because really, a smoking room is just more like a lounge for people who smoke, because the rest of the ship was pretty much open to people who smoked. So, like, there were very few areas on the ship where you couldn't smoke, so that was pretty interesting. And you know that because when you walk around the Queen Mary, there there are areas where there were ashtrays embedded in the walls all over the ship. Like, all over. Because um, people could just walk around the ship lighting up a cigarette, you know? It's crazy. <laughs> Commodore Urban says, Hello, Alex. Question, what do you think of SS United States? I... You know, unfortunately, I already did, like, 20 minutes of talking about my thoughts on the SS United States earlier in the live stream. So you'll have to go back to the beginning of the live stream to watch that. Um, let's see. Brayden says, what would happen if the Queen Mary... Filled and glided? I'm sorry, I don't understand what your question is. What happened if the Queen Mary filled and glided? I don't know. 
Doc says, Mike, I wonder if whole ship smelled like cigarettes. You know, I don't think it did. I mean, it smelled... So, there are people who say that the Queen Mary smelled similar to how it does today. Um, it smells like a library mixed a little bit with cigar smoke. So, it didn't necessarily smell like cigarettes. It probably had a very deep smell, kind of similar to how it does today. Yeah, just an, a library with a little tinge of cigar smoke. Um, Stephanie says, I can't even fathom making the choice of B slash T going down in the ship in the North Atlantic versus braving massive waves in a lifeboat. Oh, you know, that is something that I think about a lot, actually. Let me just drink this down. So, when I'm going to prepare to go on the Queen Mary 2 across the Atlantic, I think there is a, a part of me that actually kind of fears being out in the open ocean. I've never been on the open ocean. I've never been on a cruise. I've never, you know, um, the only boats I've ever been on have either been very firmly secured to the dock or they've been like small boats on a river and I've never like gone anywhere on them I don't think no I've never even taken a boat down a river it's all, I've, the only boats I've ever been on were always moored to a dock so I do have a, a big fear of being out in the middle of the Atlantic I really do um, and you know, my friend, uh, LMG Vids, he's in the chat, actually. He's the one that will be traveling with me. And, he, you know, he's like, oh, I want to go, you know, during the winter season where there's all these storms. Because, you know, the Queen Mary 2 is a true ocean liner and she can battle those storms really well. You almost don't even know there's a storm happening outside because the ship is so steady. Um... And, you know, I'm not against going during the bad winter weather, um, but I, I will not lie and say that it doesn't worry me. It does kind of worry me. I mean, if anything happened and I had to get on a lifeboat out on those huge ocean swells, I don't know. I think I would... <laughs> <laughs> I think I would die of fright before I ever got rescued. So, yeah, I don't know. Boy, the tea today is extra strong. Um, oh, see you later, Steve. Top and present line says, Alex... Where in the UK do you plan to visit when you sail to the UK aboard the Queen Mary 2, such as Liverpool, Southampton, Clydebank? Um, to make it a really, really short, you know, um, explanation, because I in the description below is my video about what I plan to do. But a really short description is Southampton, London, Bristol, Belfast, Paris. So five major cities is where I plan to go. And this was not a rash decision. We really talked through this days upon days upon days, figuring out the fastest and easiest ways to get the most out of our trip, because there's a lot of things I want to film and try to make as many videos about it as possible. Um, so yeah, I don't want people to think like, oh, you know, but you can just quickly come up to Edinburgh and see it. And I'm I'd love to go to Edinburgh, but it just does not fit in our schedule. So, um, but yeah, those are the cities we plan to see. Um, there is an ever so slight possibility we could see Swindon, but uh, it's not not likely. Not likely. Um, let's see here. Kevin says there were 15 four funnel liners produced. Chris says never heard of no cap being referred to no crap. Well, Chris, think about it. They're, the words always stem from something else. They didn't just make up cap. It came from something. 
So that's how that's how slang works. They use real words, they chop them up, and put them in there. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's it comes from something. Tyler says, interesting you said God willing. My grandma often says God willing, and if the creek don't dry. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Alex in the seaside of Bulgaria says, which is your most successful video in your opinion? Honestly, I'm not sure for myself, but I guess it's the one about your top 10 ocean liners. I like to hear what others think. Actually, my most successful video ever is my video about um, the Rolling Mary. So that's what it's called, the Rolling Mary. It's about how the Queen Mary rolled um, frequently and also in rough seas and some stories about, you know, her being hit by um, uh, 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 a rogue wave and such. So that's actually a really good video that got something like 350,000 views or something like that. So that's my most successful video without a doubt, yeah. But quickly running up to it is my video about the creation of Disneyland. I think that's at almost 250,000 views. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Doc says, Alex, I'm stuck on the smoking thing. Were there fires often? I wouldn't say often, but fires were a very real, um, a very real thing for ocean liners. Because fires do, you know, did break out on ocean liners. And when they did, they could spread rapidly. Especially back then, because the ocean liners had a lot of wood, you know. They're, they're, um, they had bulkheads made of steel, but some bulkheads had, like, wood framing with wood paneling over it. Um, the Queen Mary has some wood framing with wood paneling, especially in areas where the steel bulkhead doesn't extend out. Instead, they build a wall using wood framing. And so, um, with ships like the Queen Mary, one of the interesting things about the Queen Mary is the design of her wood paneling. Because the wood paneling was designed to slowly burn instead of quickly burn. And the way that they did that was by sandwiching the wood veneer uh, over two layers of very thin plywood that was separated by a layer of asbestos. So the asbestos, the idea was if the panel caught fire, it would burn very slowly because the asbestos would hinder the wood's ability to spread the flame quickly. It would actually, the asbestos would choke the flame out. So... The hope was that either the wood panel would burn slowly or it would just plain, you know, quickly extinguish. And so um, the other thing about ships like the Queen Mary, because the Queen Mary wasn't the only one, but ships like the Queen Mary, they also had um, fire doors. So they designated sections of the ship as as fire zones. So even the Queen Mary, when you look at her blueprints, um, there are areas that can be sealed up with fire doors, and a fire can just be contained in that area of the ship, which is absolutely brilliant. So um, even to this day, the original fire doors on the Queen Mary are still used for the hotel. So when you walk down the hallways and you see the open fire doors and you walk through them, those are the original fire doors on the Queen Mary, and they're still used today, and they're, they're still functional. Still functional. So that's one of the interesting things about the Queen Mary. So they were very careful about fires on ships. To my knowledge, Queen Mary did have a fire once. Um, Steve would probably know more about it. I, I don't know if it happened after. No, no, he said it happened during... During uh, 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 her time at sea. Because remember, you guys, I was talking about my favorite room aboard the Queen Mary, which is the... Um, second class overflow lounge on a deck and one of the reasons why that was changed supposedly had something to do with a disgruntled crewman setting fire to the room so the fire was contained in the room but the room had to be remodeled and they remodeled it to um, to be a room for teenagers
Dredden says, do you think that Normandy would sail until the 1960s like the Cunard Queens? That's an interesting question because a lot of people forget that some of the biggest criticisms about ships like Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, and Normandy, well, not Queen Elizabeth so much, but one of the biggest things about ships like the Queen Mary that got criticism was their extravagance, the overly over-the-top gilding of the ships. And that's because prior to the First World War, <clears throat> the ships looked like palaces on the water, right? Everybody knows Titanic, Olympic, Mauritania, Lusitania, all that sort of stuff. The ships look like floating palaces, especially um, the SS Paris, which was considered like a floating palace of Versailles. Um, <clears throat> and the thing was, was that after the First World War, the class divide kind of shrank and and people on both sides of the class divide, they kind of became more humble because they all had to be forced to interact with each other during the First World War all over the world. So the idea of like, you know, <laughs> you know, taking a page from what Cal said in the movie Titanic, you know, about uh, about, you know, we are royalty, Rose, that mindset kind of changed after the First World War. And so into the 20s and 30s, um, that idea of just, like, celebrating the wealthy as, like, you know, royalty and gods was seen as distasteful. Um, so ships like the Normandy, especially among Americans, kind of got a bit of criticism over the fact that they're still stuck in the old way. And Queen Mary had a little bit of that criticism too, although Queen Mary less than the Normandy because Queen Mary had more subdued interiors. The interiors weren't so grandiose and that was on purpose. Um, but Normandy definitely looked like a floating palace and that was one of those things that got criticized. But after the Second World War, that class divide shrank even more so after the Second World War, people were just not interested in seeing those palatial interiors on buildings or ships. They thought it was just over the top and flamboyant, you know. They wanted something that looked more practical, so to speak. And so that's why the Art Deco age turned into the, the um, streamlined modern, which turned into the um, mid-century modern, or mid-century modern, if you want to call it that. And so, um, so after the 1940s, I think Normandy would have needed a major interior overhaul. They would have needed to remove all those things that people think were so beautiful about the Normandy to kind of dull it down a bit, you know? If only removing, you know, the statues, the busts, and the sculptures if only um and so that's one of those things where yeah if normandy had survived the fire or whatever they would have had to subdue those palatial interiors to meet the expectations of the modern post-war people um because i mean especially going into the 1960s when you look at ships like the ss france of, of 1960 and other modern ships of that era, you know, the Mauritania II and all that, uh, uh, the, the SS United States even, there was no, like, grandiose palatial, you know, setting inside the ship. It was practical. It was for everybody. And so, yeah, Normandy, if she had maintained those beautiful interiors through the 1960s, I don't think she would have lasted. I really don't, yeah. So that's kind of my opinion on that one. Um, Chris. Yeah, don't challenge those people, Chris. I mean, I know that some of them are just all bark and no bite, but don't, don't tempt fate. <laughs> Commodore Urban says, transatlantic drag race, who would win? 
I guess the SS United States is the fastest ocean liner ever built. Hello, Justin. Transit Biker says, plus so much ventilation everywhere aboard the ships means that smoke buildup it was unlikely an issue. Very true. The Queen Mary was one of the most well-ventilated ships of her era. Um, and believe it or not, ventilation was an issue. Did you know that the Olympic-class ships actually had kind of an issue of air stagnation the further you got deeper into the ship? Because they were good at ventilation, but they just didn't have the best ventilation techniques and technology that later ships had. So actually, Olympic class ships did have a little bit of an issue of stagnant air. Um, but Queen Mary was very well ventilated. And so eventually I want to make a video about how Queen Mary was ventilated. It'd be kind of, it'd be an interesting video. I think that sounds boring to some people, but it really would be an interesting video. But yeah, so yeah, ventilation was not really an issue on Queen Mary, which is probably why Queen Mary doesn't smell like cigarettes is because all that smoke was really vented out before it could really stick to the walls. Hello, Malibu Company. Um, let's see. Justin says, seeing the SS Great Britain in Bristol is an absolute must for any ocean liner and maritime fan. She's the one that sets the tone for the rest of the time, especially with regards to passengers. Absolutely, yeah. SS Great Britain is definitely one of the stops that we will be going to in Bristol, as well as the Clifton Suspension Bridge and the um, uh, Mauritania Room, which is a bar in Bristol where they took the paneling from RMS Mauritania's uh, first class lounge and and paneled their bar with it. So it looks like the inside of the Mauritania. So we plan to go to the Mauritania room, um, if only just to look at it. Um, and then uh, there's a few other things in Bristol. There's uh, there's just outside of Bristol is a, is a heritage railway that we're gonna see some other things but if you guys want to see the full list you can either go to the gofundme page i have a list of the things we're going to see on there i got to update that actually because i've i have added things to the list since then and then i have a video about that as well um ashton edwards says how long have you had an interest in ships I would say the first time I had an interest in ships was 2021, so less than two years ago. The reason why was because I was never really interested in ships at all. It was the very last time I ever visited the Queen Mary in January of 2020. I went with my friends Chris and Steve, um, a different Steve than the one that's on my channel a lot, um, and uh, we went there to just hang out. I didn't even want to go to the Queen Mary, to be totally honest. But my friend Chris was like, come on, come on, it'll be really fun. So I was like, all right, all right. So we went, and the minute I stepped on the Queen Mary, just something changed. All of a sudden, I just fell in love with the ship, and I couldn't stop wanting to know more about it. And so um, it was a few months later that I finally decided, you know, I might want to make a video about the Queen Mary. And then I, I spoke to a friend named Shiloh at, you know, and uh, he kind of taught me a lot about the Queen Mary. And from there, I was able to kind of take what he taught me and then learn more about it. So I spent a whole year learning about the Queen Mary, made my first videos about the Queen Mary in early 2021. And, um, and through learning about the Queen Mary, I learned about the Queen Elizabeth. And then I learned about the Mauritania. And then I learned about the Lusitania. And then I learned about the Oceanic. And so, it slowly kind of opened up, and it's still very slowly opening up for me. So I still don't know much about other ships. People ask me in my live streams all the time, "What do you think of the, the the you know MS Stockholm? What do you think of the the you know RMS Oceanic Three? And they mention all these ships that I've only barely heard of. So I think a lot of people, uh, 
I think a lot of people, they, they, they become Ocean Liner fans at a very, very young age, and then they just grow up learning about all these ships. So it's very new to them when someone like me, who's like 30 years old, barely learns about the Queen Mary in, you know, in like, you know, at the age of like 28 or something like that, you know, so it's all very new to me and uh, takes a long time to learn about these ships. So, yeah. Top impressive line says, Alex, just like the Queen Mary, the SS United States had a tendency of being a roller in rough seas. Interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. I would have thought it would be very, very stable. Or a steady. People get all over me when I say stable. So I have to use the word steady instead. Carter Asher says, can you do filming locations at Titanic Belfast? Absolutely. There is no way. There is no way I will let a single minute <laughs> of my journey to the UK and through the UK and Paris go without being filmed. Everything will be filmed. I plan to bring batteries galore. <laughs> so that way, that way my, my cameras never run out. I'm going to bring lots of um, extra memory cards so that way I can always document everything. I'm actually a bit frightened <laughs> about how much video I'm going to have to sift through when I come back home from that trip. Because that trip's going to be a month a month long. So filming like a month's worth of video, that's a lot. But the good news is, is that with all that footage, I can create a multitude of videos. A complete multitude of it. So, yeah, definitely everywhere I go will be filmed. And th that's the whole point of the trip, actually. We're not going just to go. I'm going to film. Like, that's the whole point of the trip. So, yeah, definitely the whole thing will be filmed. There'll be all kinds of things. There'll be vlogs about the journey. There'll be reviews about where we've stayed. There will be tour videos about, like, I'll film, like, what I see and then make a video virtual tour of it. Um, there'll be history videos based off of what I find and stuff like that. So there'll be history videos about the various subjects, you know, and then... You know, in future videos about separate topics, you know, I may need to use, you know, old footage of the SS Great Britain for a video so I can always tap into that. Or if I need to get footage or if I, if I need footage of, you know, um, the uh, the um, Notre Dame, I can pull from the footage I shoot of that. So the whole point is to film the entire thing so that way for decades to come, I can make more videos about everything. So, it'll be really fun. Um, J. Rod says, did the Queen Mary kitchen stove burn wood? No. All of the Queen Mary's um, kitchen appliances were entirely electric. She did have a few steam kettles, a few like, you know, for making soups, they would they would use steam, um, that kind of thing. But most everything was electric. There was no burning nothing. So, um, yeah, pretty cool. And if you think about it, the Queen Mary's kitchens, they served like Michelin star quality food. I'm not even kidding. It was uh, some of the most amazing food you could eat. And they did it all with electric electric equipment. So when I hear, you know, other chefs today being like, oh, you can't cook without gas. It's like, <laughs> it's like, that's ridiculous. Of course you can cook without gas. So. Brandon says, what would happen if the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth collided? I I guess they would get damaged. I don't know. I guess. They might even sink. Gump Happen says, hi, Alex. Watching in the background, but I hope all is well. Indeed it is, and I hope you're doing well as well.
Transit Biker says, I think the Normandy could have had a successful post-war career, career and remodel. I think if she was remodeled, she would have had a successful post-war career. But I don't think she could have remained how she looked in 1935 through the 1950s. I, people would not have enjoyed that. They, they would have... <laughs> they would not have liked that. The people of the 1950s were very, very practical people. They did not like the over-the-top um, ornateness of things. Um, Alex and the Seaside of Bulgaria. To answer your question... It's just because. It's just, it, I think, I don't know. It's just because. It's it's not like, you know, it, it, it's like everybody says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, just because I find something beautiful doesn't mean somebody else will. So I guess, you know, Oceanic is just my favorite because there's just something about it that just rings true to me, I guess. Um... Dredden asked a question, but it he kind of it kind of cut off after that. Do you think the fire's on Queen? I don't. Yeah. If you can finish your question, I'll try to answer it. Um, Stephanie says, "Did these old steamers have daycares, or was it watch your own kid?" Actually, that's a very good question. Um, a lot of the ships they had what were called um, nurseries. So they were essentially daycares. Um, the Queen Mary had three, for one for each class. So she had a first class um, children's nursery, second class children's nursery, third class children's nursery. And in the later years, the Queen Mary had um, a, a teenager's hangout spot. So in the 1950s, they installed um, what was called the Beachcombers Lounge. And that was for teenagers. It included a bowling alley and some, you know, some games and stuff like that. So it was a teenager's area. So yeah, actually, it, it, interesting enough, they did uh, they did have uh, essentially what was daycare for kids. And um, if an adult wanted, <laughs> they could pretty much leave the kid there all day, and then and then a um, uh, a, a ship stewardess would either take the kids to meet their parents at the restaurant for dinner, or uh, if the kids were particularly fussy and would have made a big scene at dinner. Because believe it or not, like today you go to a restaurant and if a kid starts crying and screaming, that's just normal, that's just what happens. But back then it was not appropriate for children to do that. So if you had a child that you knew was gonna act up like that for dinner, then you could ask the, um, the, the, um, stewardess to uh take your kid to what was um uh, what is it it was the maids and valets saloon so there was an area on the queen mary in between the first class restaurant and the second class restaurant and it was located am <laughs> amid the main kitchen there was a private dining room. It was, you know, nicely decorated, but it was for the maids and valets of the Queen Mary. But fussy children would be taken there to have their dinner, and they would sit there with the stewardess. Possibly even the, the person who was watching over the nursery would be there as well. And so, yeah, that was one of the options that you had on the Queen Mary. So if you want to learn more about it, um, I have a video called Queen Mary's Mysterious Annex. It's on the playlist about the Queen Mary docu-series. And so, yeah, it's called Queen Mary's Mysterious Annex. You can learn all about um, the different nurseries on the Queen Mary. And, uh, and well, not the nurseries themselves, but about the dining room at least. So you kind of knew what it was about. But, yeah. One day I'll have a video about the, about the nurseries um, in particular. Um, let's see...
Top impressive line says, do you think Kennard will build another real ocean liner as a running mate for the Queen Mary 2? As a running mate, no, but as a replacement, possibly. So um, when the Queen Mary 2 gets kind of in her upper age, uh, they may decide to give her a replacement. And the reason why is because um, the Queen Mary 2 is actually a very popular ship to take on a transatlantic crossing. Those transatlantic crossings book up sometimes a year in advance. So it's actually very popular. And because it books up so much, it might be worth it that eventually when the ship needs to be replaced, that they will replace it. But a running mate, I don't see that happening at the moment. But if it got more and more and more popular, they might decide to build a running mate. But I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, Chris, so the universal battery, um, I'm not going to get one specifically for UK power plugs. I'm going to get an adapter for that, but I have, um, I have batteries like that I can carry around and I can charge those connected to the adapter. Alex in the seaside of Bulgaria. Yeah, I mean, you know, kids these days, they're they're really just more interested in games and things. When I was a kid, you know, trains and ships were awesome. But nowadays, it's it's just, you know, games and fantasy adventure and stuff like that. So, yeah, it is tough. Tyler Frederick. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. Ken says, apply for your passport now. I have, I, yeah, I might be moving in the coming months. So I'm going to wait till after I move. So that way I can get my passport. I've got plenty of time because even when I save up the money in fall, I'll probably I'll probably only be able to book a voyage for fall of 2024. So I'll have a whole other year. But yeah, I will definitely get my passport after I move again. Still no snow. Dreden says, do you think the fires on Queen Elizabeth were set intentionally? Yes, I, th I think, in my opinion, they were set by anti-imperialists, but not by C.Y. Tung. C.Y. Tung was not the person who burned down the Queen Elizabeth. I think it was um, anti-imperialists. People, you know, you know, people in China who did not want the British culture to be there anymore. Iron Legion says, do you think if Carpathia wasn't sunk, she would have been preserved? If the Olympic wasn't preserved, I don't think Carpathia would have been preserved. There would have been no point. Yeah. Mike says, you're moving. Tyler says, you're moving. Leonard says, moving again. Um, yeah, so... Um, I will be moving to a new apartment in the same apartment complex. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, in an effort to 
get more space and, you know, sometimes, you know, when you live in an apartment, sometimes it's necessary to move, you know, so some, it's, uh, yeah, 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 it's comp, I'm not ready to talk about it yet, it's complex. Transit Biker says, Alex, any plans to ever visit Naval History Museums? There's a whole bunch in the Northeast. I, I'm i not, you know, I, I'm not interested in naval history or naval ships or military anything. So I don't see myself doing that. I only visit that kind of stuff if I'm already there. You know, if, like, if I'm like 10 feet away from it and other people I'm with are like, hey, let's go see that. I'll be like, okay, let's go see it. But I don't go out of my way to visit stuff like that. Chris. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you take any kid to, like, a ship or something, and then they'll find it cool. But if you're in a classroom, and you're like, hey, kids, look at this picture, they'll be like, okay. Okay. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. But if you take anybody to a ship, you can get them interested in it. So the problem isn't that people walk aboard these ships and they don't care. It's that the it's getting them to get aboard the ship is the issue. Um, Alex on Seaside of Bulgaria. I don't know anything about the MV Britannic or the MV Georgic. I couldn't answer that for you. Carter Asher says, Did you cry when Titanic sank in 1997? I was too young to know how sad it was. So I sat there in the theater just kind of going like, oh, wow, that was crazy. You know, like, I was too young to know how sad it was. I didn't actually start crying over the Titanic movie till like, till like I was a teenager. Yeah. Dreden says, would the Queen Mary survive a fire like the Normandy? Well, the Normandy could have survived her own fire. The problem was, was that during the conversion, a lot of the ship's safety systems were dismantled to make the conversion easier. So, but if her safety systems weren't dismantled temporarily, her own fire doors, her own, you know, safety systems could have put out the fire or prevented it from spreading. So I think... I think that as long as the safety systems were allowed to stay on, most ships could have at least reduced the effect of the fire. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Justin. Transit Biker says, the size of these ships is not translated well in photos. They're gigantic. Absolutely. And also being on them is different. You know, you can see them on video and it just doesn't do it justice. As being on the ship suddenly transforms you back into a different era, a different age. And so you have to be on these ships to really fully appreciate them. That's not to say that you can't enjoy what you see on a video, but being there is all is an experience. It's an experience. Alex and he said of Bulgaria. I've seen a night to remember. It's not particularly any of my favorite video, but but I I, I have seen it, yeah. It was okay. Brayden I try not to answer questions like that because then what happens is after I answer that question, somebody else, you know, inserts a different ship. Oh, would this ship have survived? Would that ship have survived? I actually kind of regret making my video about what would have happened if the Queen Mary had been struck by Titanic's iceberg. I made that video because I thought it'd be fun. But then next thing I know in the comments, I got flooded with, well, what about this ship? What about that ship? And I was kind of like, oh boy, I opened a can of worms I did not want to open. So yeah, I try not to answer questions like that.
Chris. That's pretty cool. I think... How old was I? I think I was five when I saw it. It was at a family theater. Uh, somewhere in Orange County, California. I don't know what theater it was. I don't even think the theater's still around, to be totally honest. Um, but yeah, I did see it there. And uh, it was a family theater, so they cut out all the bad parts and just left the rest of the movie. And it was really cool. It was really cool. But I was too young to really, like, cry over sad parts. Um, so Alex, um, it's weird for me to say Alex, because that's my name. <laughs> um, let's see. Do I think it's going to be repaired anytime soon? No. I, it's important to look at these things not from the whole, you know, like not, eh, what am I trying to say? It's too soon to ask that question. Right now, the question at hand is... Will the ship have a place to stay? If not, that poses another question. If the ship doesn't have a place to stay, will it have to be scrapped? And then from will it have to be scrapped, that asks another question. So it's important not to zoom so far out that you're asking, will it be re repaired or restored? That's That's a question for another time. So, yeah. Dreden says, what was the fastest speed recorded for Queen Mary? So that's an interesting one. So officially on her speed trials, the fastest recorded speed was 32.84 knots, which was pretty darn fast for her time. But during World War II, when the ship was about to pass through an area that was infested with uh, enemy U-boats, enemy submarines, on occasion... The captain would order the ship to uh, to build up more steam. And when they did that, they had to uh, disengage the safety systems of the propulsion plant. So there were normally ways to prevent a boiler from becoming overpressurized beyond the safe limit. And they would disengage that. So that way they could build pressure beyond the safe limit. And that's what they did on occasion. And so they would build up... Um, so the, the Queen Mary's boilers could produce 425 pounds of steam pressure. But during those rare moments, they would build the steam pressure to 750 at times. And when they did that, uh, the ship would run some people reported in the logs that the ship was going between 38 and a half to 39 knots which is incredibly fast and that was just a short sprint through a particularly dangerous area because when you're going that fast and consuming that much fuel there was an engineer who checked the fuel tanks they you could walk into some of the fuel tanks and he said, when he looked at it, that when the Queen Mary was going that speed, you could see the fuel tanks dropping with your own eyes because they was consuming so much fuel to go that speed. So technically, the fastest recorded speed was about 39 knots, which is incredible, incredible. But that was only during World War II and with the safety systems disengaged, so... Brayden says, were dogs allowed to stay in the cabins on the Queen Mary? Another interesting question. Technically, no. Dogs were not allowed to be with their owners anywhere on the ship. The only place that dogs were allowed to be was at the dog kennels on the Queen Mary. But there were two passengers 
who had an exception to that rule. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor. So that would be the former King Edward VIII and his wife, Wallace Simpson. And when they would bring their pugs onto the ship, they were allowed to keep their pugs in their stateroom. So, because, you know, they, you know, former king. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they were the only ones in Queen Mary's history. The only ones. Um... Chris, I wouldn't say that the only type of ship that could survive is an Iowa-class battleship. There are mitigating circumstances that could lead a ship to survive. So if you watch my video about the Queen Mary surviving the iceberg collision, there are circumstances that would lead the ship to survive such a collision. Master Kai says, what are the Queen Mary updates? Stay tuned this Friday for Queen Mary updates. Kayla Carr Caden says, hey, Alex, what is your favorite Walt Disney World Railroad locomotive and why? I don't have one. I don't like the Walt Disney World Railroad. It doesn't operate realistically like a real railroad does. Uh, the engines do not, they look really weird. They're not designed realistically to look like steam engines did back then. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. I do not like the Walt Disney World Railroad. You're welcome, Jay. Daniel says, Alex, did Queen Mary also vibrate like the Lusitania Mauritania? The Queen Mary did. In her first two years of operation, she did vibrate quite, quite crazy. Um, but they were able to fix that with repairs, not repairs necessarily, but changes made to some of the propulsion system, as well as replacing the propellers with more hydrodynamic propellers that reduced the vibrations. So yeah, Queen Mary, she vibrated pretty badly in her first two years. So did SS Normandy, in fact. SS Normandy did the same thing, changed out the propellers, and uh, they were able to reduce that. Um, but the same thing happened for Mauritania and Lusitania. Um, they were able to fix the heavy vibration and reduce that significantly by changing out the propellers. And I actually have a video about that. So if you watch my video called, Why Did Ocean Liners Vibrate? Or was it When Ocean Liners Vibrated? It's in my playlist about um, Ocean Liner docu-series is the playlist. And you'll see a big picture on it with the Mauritania, or is it Lusitania? One of the two, vibrating. Anyway, good video. Talks about why the ships vibrated and how they fixed it. Um, let's see. Alex says, would you rather sail aboard the RMS... Sorry, I'm having just... Whoa. Would you rather sail aboard the RMS Queen Elizabeth or on board the RMS Queen Elizabeth II... Both ships were stylish and had additions, especially the QE2. I'd rather have sailed aboard the original Armist Queen Elizabeth. The QE2 is on my favorites list, but I don't consider it anywhere near as beautiful as the original Queen Elizabeth. I, again, I'm mostly a fan of ships before the Second World War. I really like the Art Deco style in particular. Um, QE2 has its own type of beauty, but it's too modern for me. I think the only other ship... Well, I don't remember, but I think even the Queen Mary 2 I like more than the QE 2. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I would prefer to sail aboard the original Queen Elizabeth. Alex says, do you know which ocean liner served for the longest period of time? And if you do, do you know how long it was in service? So, the longest ocean liner to serve as an ocean liner I 
I feel like that would have to go to the QE2. Longest ocean liner to serve as an ocean liner. But technically, the longest ocean liner in service at sea would have been the Astoria, which was converted to a cruise ship and sailed up until 2020, I want to say. And now it's it's uh, it's possibly going to go to the scrapyard. Yeah. Qu uh, QE2 was at sea for, what was it, 39 years? QE2 at, for 39 years. Astoria, I have no idea. Astoria was like 1952? I don't know. I'm still I'm still too new to ocean liners to really answer that question. Um Brayden says, was there any cars on the Queen Murray? Absolutely. So um there was almost a car on every voyage. Pretty much. Maybe a car every other voyage. And they even had um there were sometimes multiple cars, so they actually had a specific cargo hold on the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth that were specifically designated for cars. And they could fill it with other uh, with other cargo after the cars were loaded. But yeah, the they had a specific cargo hold specifically for what they called motor cars. So that's what they referred to them as. But pretty cool. Um, Queen Elizabeth had a, a larger capacity for motor cars. Did she ever really need it? I don't know. But she had a larger capacity for motor cars than the Queen Mary did. Um, and then, in fact, the last... Uh, the, the last, uh, you know, uh, petroleum-powered vehicle to be loaded on the Queen Mary was actually two London double-decker buses. Authentic double-decker buses were loaded onto the Queen Mary in Southampton, and she sailed all the way to Long Beach, around Cape Horn at the tip of South America, all the way up to Long Beach with those two buses on there. And they were actually stacked, not in the cargo holds, because they were too tall for the cargo holds. They were stacked on a deck. No. Main deck. I'm sorry. Main deck aft. So it was outside, and it was stacked there right uh, just forward of the docking bridge. And uh, pretty neat. Um, when they rounded Cape Horn, they sold little tickets so passengers could go on the double-decker buses while they rounded Cape Horn, and they could say that they rode the London buses round the horn. So, pretty neat little information. Uh... Cab Car Caden says, Hey Alex, have you heard about the Strasbourg Railroad and the NNW 611? I've heard of the Strasbourg Railroad, but the NNW 611, no, I haven't heard of it. See you later, Mike. Uh, Alex says, I agree with you about the QE. Justin says, Sorry to ask him, but how long did it take for the Cunard line to pay off the government loans to build the two queens. I actually don't know. I've never come across information that 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 uh, talked about that. It had to have been soon because because when the Queen Mary returned to service, when, when both ships, when both ships returned to service, peacetime service, after World War II, the British Parliament actually paid Cunard Line money for using their ships. So it's possible that, that they paid it off sometime in the late 1930s. But I don't know, because I've never come across that information before. Diana Mary says, how's the model train? It's doing good. There's no, been no progress since the last time I posted any kind of progress report on the on the model railroad. Um, I just haven't had the time. 
Uh, Alex says, I remember that the longest serving ocean liner in general was Kennard's first Parthia. She served for 86 years. As for an ocean liner serving as an ocean liner, yes, it is the QE2. Interesting. Brayden Edwards says, why did they have a cruiser stern? Well, I have a video about that also. Um, so in it's the video called um, Queen Mary, A Whole Lot to Know. It's a pun. Um, and it's also in my Queen Mary docuseries playlist. But uh, it talks about the different features of Queen Mary's hull, what it was used for, and especially it talks about the cruiser stern. But essentially, the reason why the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth had a cruiser stern was to reduce drag of the water on the hull in order to help the ships be more efficient out at sea. You see, ships like SS Bremen, SS Europa, SS Normandy, they had slightly bulbed bows to reduce the bow wave to reduce drag on the ships, which made them more efficient. Some people say it, was, it made them faster, but not that much faster. Really, it was more about efficiency. Um, but uh, because it took less effort to push the ships through the water. Um, but uh, at the time, the bulbous bow technology was still very, very new. Nobody really knew if it worked that well. So what Kinnard did was they actually tried a different method, something that was more tried and true and proven than a bulbous bow, and that was the cruiser stern. So... Up until certain ships, I forget which ones, but, um, but, uh, no, what am I trying to say? Ships like Normandy did not have a cruiser stern. She had what was called a fantail stern. And, um, the fantail stern did not help with the issue of drag. It actually made it worse. So by giving Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth a cruiser stern, it helped add buoyancy to the aft end of the ships. So that way, that way, when they sailed, the ships, the back end of the ships didn't dig into the water as deep, and therefore the water didn't rise along the edges of the hull as far, and therefore it reduced the drag on the ship. So that's what the reason for the cruiser stern is. I go into a better detail um, in that video I mentioned. So let's see. Kevin says Astoria served 45 years as an ocean liner. Interesting. Yeah, see, I just don't know that much about ocean liners, you guys. Um, Stephanie says, did all the crew on the Queen Mary eat the same food, or was it tiered? Um, I believe it was a lot like... It was, a, it was a lot like a cafeteria. There was kind of like a few things, not a lot, but a few things that they could choose from. So they didn't have to eat the, the exact same thing as the next person sitting next to them, but there was a limited variety. So they did, they did have to essentially eat what was on the menu, but there was a little bit of variety as to like what they could choose to eat versus not to eat. Um, and then the, there was a bar called the Pig and Whistle on both Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. And the Pig and Whistle was located aft on sea deck. And was it? Yeah. Yeah. Or was it was it our deck? I'd have to look at the the plans, but it was aft of the ship, either our deck aft or sea deck aft. And it was a little place where you could... It was a bar. You could order drinks. I, I want to say it was really for men only. I don't think the women would have gone there to order drinks. Um, but there's photographs of them all kind of sitting around. It wasn't very decorated. It, was, it, was, it wasn't decorated at all, actually. It was just plain steel bulkheads and everything. Um, and then they would set up crates and stuff to sit on. Uh, but the bar itself was a little room with a window that they served you your drinks from. And that was for the crew only. Um, but yeah. Alex says, the SS United States, the SS France of 1962, 
The Queen Mary and QE were basically almost the same length, so why wasn't the SS United States and SS France as heavy as the Cunard Queens? The material used? Um, so... A ship's size is measured with what's called gross register tons. But th that's kind of a misnomer. It, that's not a measurement of weight. That's a measurement of volume of passenger spaces. And so, um, but there is a way to measure the weight of the ships, which is just through, um, which is just through, uh, uh, tonnage. And yeah, I guess the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth probably would have been heavier than those other ships. But the reason why was because, um... The heavier a ship is, the harder it is to push it through the water. I mean, it's the same thing with anything, even with even with people. You know, I'm like a really big guy, and you know, compared to my skinny friend Eric, you know, it takes more energy for me to walk down, a, you know, a street than it does for him, just because I'm larger. You know, so it's the same thing for ships. It takes more energy, more fuel to push a heavy ship. So by making the ship significantly lighter. Um, they could be pushed through the water a lot easier. And one of the ways that they did that with ships like the SS United States and the, and the SS France and the, um, and the, uh, 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 the, um, SS, uh, QE2 was, um, was by, instead of building all the interiors out of steel bulkheads they made them out of aluminum bulkheads they later learned that aluminum was not a good material to use because what they did what they didn't know about was that aluminum fatigues really easily uh it's the same thing like if you have a little sheet of aluminum like cut from a can or something if you bend it enough times it'll start to snap and break and all that sort of stuff steel does that too but it takes a lot more to to do that and so um so yeah so they learned that aluminum was not a good idea um but those ships were much lighter because they used aluminum for the interior passenger area bulkheads and pillars um so yeah that's why so it's actually kind of funny because a lot of people They'll, they'll tell me, like, oh, well, you know, SS France was technically the largest ocean liner ever to exist before the Queen Mary II. But if you actually look at gross register tonnage, which is how they measure a ship based off of the volume of enclosed passenger space, um, technically the largest ship before the Queen Mary II was the Queen Elizabeth, you know. So, um, yeah, pretty interesting. And then if you look at a ship's length... Like, uh, let's say the length at the waterline. I forget what they call that. It's like length at the waterline or something like that. But anyway, if you look at the length of the waterline, Queen Mary was longer than SS Normandy at length of the waterline. So that's pretty interesting. And that has to do with her, that has to do with her cruiser stern as well. Um, so yeah, just little interesting tidbits. Uh... John says, do you think the Queen Mary 2 is on-the-fly maintenance, allowing quicker turnarounds, will shorten its lifespan? No, I don't think so. Because um, they still do the, uh, the annual overhauls by taking it into a dry dock to do the basic, you know, normal overhaul stuff that they do. Um, so, no, I don't think so. I mean, the... The difference between the maintenance done on the original Queen Mary and the Queen Mary 2 are not so different. The only real difference is that they just don't spend as much money on it today as they would have back then. So, um, yeah. But I don't think it'll shorten the lifespan of the ship at all. If anything, if anything, the Queen Mary 2 might possibly outlast the QE2 when it comes to being on the ocean in service. The QE2 had to to quit 
not just because it was getting old, but actually because of its aluminum framing, the ship was becoming heavily fatigued and it wouldn't have been safe much longer to keep the ship out on the ocean due to the, the aluminum fatigue. But it is estimated that the, the Queen Mary II, as long as they keep up its maintenance, it could last longer at sea than the Queen Elizabeth, than the, than the QE2, sorry. Um, so who knows? I mean, that would be good news for me, I think, because I, I want the Queen Mary II to last longer than just 40 years, you know? So, yeah. Ooh, this is... Uh, Gianni or Gianni the Cool Gamer says, Why did Titanic's middle propeller stop when it went full astern? Well, first and foremost, in real life, the Titanic did not go full astern when they found the iceberg was in front of them. Because the people running the ship knew that they could turn faster <laughs> if they didn't run the ships astern. So, in fact, they didn't stop the engines until after they collided with the iceberg. It was Captain uh, Smith who woke up and told them to stop the engines. And then they did. In the movie, they changed it around, probably because it was more exciting that way. But um, they never ran it full astern. But the reason why it, it stopped in the movie um, is because the central propeller was operated by a steam turbine engine. That steam turbine engine was not capable of going in reverse. It had only one direction, forward. And so as soon as they ran the reciprocating engines uh, in reverse, the middle engine could not reverse. So, um, in fact, that was kind of a common issue, was that uh, it wouldn't be until a few years later that they would develop dual directional steam turbine engines so even the rms mauritania she had to have a separate set of engines that were turned in the opposite direction applied to the two the two middle propeller shafts in order for her to reverse because the other four turbines could not reverse they didn't have that capability so it's kind of an interesting story the queen mary uh was equipped with um each engine had two dual directional turbines in them so yeah pretty cool hello element how's it going Uh, Alex and the Seaside of Bulgaria, that's another ship that I just don't know enough about to be able to answer your question. And you're welcome for telling you about the weight. That is true, Transit Biker. Queen Mary 2 does have a a um, hybrid stern. <clears throat> um, so, Alex, I know that SS Norway or, you know, the, yeah, SS Norway, ex-SS France, I know that it had a boiler explosion, but I just don't know enough about the ship to know, like, why that happened and what happened afterwards that's I, I all i know is i know it had a boiler explosion but i just don't know enough about the ss france to be able to answer that question brayden says how many trains do you have uh in on 30 scale like the one behind me i have three different trains i have a freight train which is one that's running right now then i have a log train 
Um, and then I have a passenger train. So technically three trains and two engines. I have a Forney engine and a Porter engine. So that is what makes up my stock of, um, of cars and engines and stuff. I have stuff in N scale as well, but I don't run them. I don't do N scale anymore. But I still kept some of my trains and locomotives from N scale. Um, will I make more videos on it? Yes, but only when I have time. Uh, this, you know, so I haven't stopped. It's not like it's not like I officially stopped making videos about them. There, there will be more videos. It's just that uh, I've been really, really busy lately, so I just haven't had time to work on the stuff and and continue it. But yeah. Um, Matt, nice to see you too. Did you see Titanic Honor and Glory's new release trailer? Do you think they made the right choice moving away from making a game toward a virtual tour experience of the ship? Um, I've been speaking to Titanic Honor and Glory. They, they have not stopped making the game. So they are branching out to two different projects. So I can't go any further into that. But they have already mentioned that, so it's not like I... Not like I revealed anything, but um, but they have not stopped making the alpha game. That is for sure. So, but I can't say anything more because I'm not allowed to. Um, but um, but yeah, um, and then uh, I will be able to play the game when the new when the new uh, demo version comes out on March third. I will actually be able to play it sooner than March third. So that way I can kind of make some videos for you guys and stuff like that. So I'm actually really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, pretty excited. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of great things coming to Titanic Honor and Glory. And it's going to be slow going, you know, because it's, it's a group of volunteers, essentially, um, who are doing all that work, you know, in between working their normal day jobs and stuff like that. They come home and work on that so it's gonna take a while but there's a lot of really amazing things to come so uh stephanie thank you for joining the chat <laughs> uh let's see ss norway was scrapped in 2006 i think i heard something about that nathan says hey alex have you seen any movies that were filmed on the queen mary pre-long beach Pre Long Beach, uh, I I know of a few videos, like there was a video, like like a movie. I mean, there was a movie that was called Assault on a Queen. That's only one of many, by the way. There were many movies that were filmed on the ship prior to her Long Beach years, but Assault on the Queen was one of the most extensive filmings on the ship prior to her retirement. But I have not seen that movie yet. I'll have to rent it from Amazon. Um, but no. I have not seen any movies from before her Long Beach years. Um, Alex in the Seaside of Bulgaria says, When are your videos about the Armas Mauritania is are going to come out? <sighs> you know, I have learned to not schedule my videos. Because every time I work on a video and schedule it to come out, something happens and I can't meet that expectation. But I do already have scripts in the works. They're not completed yet, but they are like halfway done for videos about the Mauritania. Um, as well as I'm currently working on a script for Queen Elizabeth. Now, why... When I have half of a script ready for Mauritania, did I suddenly decide to do Queen Elizabeth? Well, because remember earlier in, in the in the chat when I was saying that it sometimes takes me months or even a year to research the topics for a video? This is one of those times. When I started learning about Mauritania, there was so much information when I went back and double-checked it that I realized I was getting wrong. And when I first read through it, I thought I had the right information. So it's turned out to be a real can of worms, the Mauritania topic. And so I'm still new to Mauritania. I'm still learning about it. And as I learn about it, I have to double check the information I'm reading and make sure that other sources claim the same information. And plus, there's just a lot of information. How do I sift through 
the information and pick and choose which one to tell you guys about and which one I'm going to have to wait to tell you guys about. So it's become a really long process. And to be honest, the Queen Elizabeth is something I know more about off the top of my head than I know of the Queen uh, of the Mauritania. So I decided that in the interim, while I'm working on the Mauritania video, I'm going to get the Queen Elizabeth video out first because I already know enough about the Queen Elizabeth that I could make a video on that. So, and even then, the Mauritania video, I wouldn't expect a full documentary of the Mauritania until at least the end of the year or the beginning of next year. Because for now, I only know enough information to tell you bits and pieces about the history of the Mauritania. It's not like the Queen Mary where I could just quickly type up a whole history of the Queen Mary right now and then produce a video for you guys and then it's like this huge documentary. The Mauritania is still so new in my head that uh, I'm just not confident enough to make a video about it. And part of that apprehension comes with the first time I made a Queen Mary video. In 2021, I had done a whole year of research on the Queen Mary, and I finally decided to make my first video about it. And I got a bunch of stuff wrong, and people just jumped on me over it. And I was just kind of like, okay, now I'm going to make triple sure that before I put out any videos about a subject, I've done my best. So that's why it's taking so long. And of course, you know, sometimes my schedule gets thrown off because I'll work on a video for months and months and then I can't make that video and I have to switch to another video. So <sighs> yeah, but this Friday um, will be an update on Queen Mary's construction. Don't expect to see images of the ship's restoration. I don't have that. Um, but there will be information based off of what's going on the ship right now. And then next Friday will be a history video about the RMS Queen Elizabeth. So that's what's in the works for right now. Uh, let's see. All right, folks, I'm going to end the live stream here. It's been two hours and 23 minutes, so <laughs> I'm tired and I need to eat dinner and then continue working more on on uh, my construction update, update video. Ron, yes. Um, when the Queen Mary reopens, which should be sometime in April, um, they will have 100 rooms open. So that means that she will be open just like she was prior to the pandemic. Um, certain attractions on the ship will close for the night at a certain time, um, but there will still be late night tours and stuff. Um, but there are some interesting details. I don't know if I if I should open that can of worms right now. I you probably have to wait till Friday to see the update video where I'll talk about some of the things that we might have to expect when the ship reopens. Um, but yeah, when you look online, you see the thing is that the Queen the Queen Mary um, website is for the most part still abandoned. I don't think I don't think the city of Long Beach has legal access to that website because that website is not <laughs> owned by the Queen Mary. That website is was owned by Urban Commons. So it's not technically the city's website. So we'll see if they get control of it. They may have to create a whole new website. But that website is essentially abandoned. I think there might be one or two things that have been updated so far, but um, but it's essentially abandoned. So I wouldn't go by what the website says. Either check Facebook. On, on Facebook, the Queen Mary Hotel has its own page. So if you want information about the Queen Mary, check their Facebook page or check in on my channel because I'll have the latest information about the Queen Mary. Um, but don't go by, and this goes for everybody, don't go by what the website or Google says about the Queen Mary, because as far as we know, it is both those things are abandoned. They they don't have full access to it because it was it all that information was it belonged to a different company. 
So, yeah, but I'll keep you guys updated. Um, let's see. Yep, all right, you guys. Thank you all for joining me, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.